you've surely heard of the famous constant E. When it comes to math, it's all around the place. I mean, it describes a lot of important phenomena in statistics, builds up a first share of calculus, and has a special place in the realm of complex numbers. Math is not the only place where it thrives, though, because it also shows up in physics when studying the decay of radioactive materials, and in biology when studying population growth, just as in tens if not hundreds of other seemingly unrelated fields of science. But what is E really about? What is so special about this number 2.71828 and so on? Let's see. So the Euler's number was first stated by Jacob Bernoulli in 1683 in the course of his work on compound interest. So compound interest says that you get a little bit of money in interest every period and that money you made helps you get even more money next period. In other words, your interest compounds. So if you had a dollar and the bank offered you a 100% interest rate on it, then after a year, you would have another dollar. But it's not the best you can get, it's not even close to that. If the bank was to give you money twice a year, splitting the interest rate in half as well, after six months, you would get another 50 cents, ending up with 150 in total, and after another half a year, you would get 50% of that 1. 50 ending up with 225 in total. And it turns out that the more often you evaluate your interest, the better you're off. Evaluating every quarter will get you 2.44, and evaluating it every month will get you 2.61. Also, notice that we can use this formula here to calculate the amount of money we're gonna be left with after calculating the interest rate and times from the year because we're just multiplying that one that we started with by the fractional representation of the percentage that we are earning each period. And so a question arises, can we skyrocket a profit just by evaluating interest more often? Let's see. Evaluating interest every week will get you $2.69, doing it every day will get you $2.71, Every hour will make you $2.72. The difference is visibly shrinking. This value, I think it's approaching something. But how do we find the value that we're approaching here? Well, let's calculate this interest every minute, every second, every millisecond. Let's do it continuously and let's never stop. We'll end up with 2.71828 and so on dollars. Precisely E. Cool, huh? But where is Leonard Euler in all this? I mean, this number is named after him, for God's sake, so he has to be somewhere around here. And he is. Actually, Jacob Bernoulli was unable to evaluate this limit just so, and it was Leonard Euler who worked it out in 1737. But how did he do it? So let's start with the compound interest formula I showed you guys earlier. And so, what if I wanted to evaluate E squared, let's say? Well, then I would have to square both sides of this equality. Okay, love it. But now, I would like to introduce a neat trick here. I would like to multiply that fractions numerator inside that parenthesis by a 2, and then divide that entire fraction by a 2 as well. Okay, so now what I have here is this kind of a limit, but the nice thing is that what I did there did not change the rate at which that n goes to infinity. So what I can do here is just change my limiting variable to let's say m, yeah, so I'm gonna say that that 2n is going to be equal to an m. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, well, this is a lovely trick because now I know how to calculate e squared. And an even better thing is that I can change that to and perform the same trick with whatever power I choose, let's say x. Then I will get this expression for e to the power of x, which is this limit as m goes to infinity of 1 plus x over m all to the power of m. How do we get something useful out of it? Well, we could, for example, go on and expand that parenthesized expression using the binomial theorem right here. And so, listing a few first terms, and then taking the limit as our m goes to infinity, a bunch of things are gonna cancel or just, well, tend to a 1 there, and we're left with this infinite polynomial here. And let me remind you that this was the representation for e to the power of whatever variable x that we choose. But now we were looking for just the plain old e, which is e to the power of 1. So let me just plug in x equal to 1 in all that stuff here, and we get our answer. And Euler used this formula here in order to derive first 18 digits 
of e. The most important property of the Euler's number is that its exponential function e to the power of x is its own derivative. What it means is that at any given point a, the value of the function is e to the power of a, the slope of the line that is tangent to its curve at that point is also e to the power of a, and the area beneath the curve from negative infinity up to a is also equal to e to the a, and that's the only function that has this property. But where does it come from? So let me just go back to this infinite polynomial that we proved would describe the exponential function of e. And now, well, if I were to take the derivative of both sides, on the right-hand side, I'm just adding a bunch of things together so I can just take the derivative of one at a time. So the derivative of e to the power of x is going to be, and now, the derivative of 1 is going to be 0, differentiating x gives us a 1, then differentiating that x squared by 2 gives us just the x, x cubed by 3 factorial, well this gives us x squared all over 2 factorial, and so on and so forth. And we actually see that those two, the polynomial describing the derivative of e to the power of x and the polynomial describing e to the power of x itself, they are the same, especially that these are both infinite, so losing that first term at the very beginning doesn't really matter to those polynomials at all. And so we get that the derivative of e to the power of x is going to be e to the power of x. And you can use this fact to derive the very, very famous formula for the derivative of any exponential function of any constant a. And so the derivative of a to the power of x is going to be well, we could write a to the power of x as e to the power of the logarithm base e of a to the power of x, bring that x down in front of the log base e of a, and this, using our property that we had proven earlier, and also the chain rule will give us that the derivative of this thing is going to be just e to the x times the log base e of a multiplied by the derivative of x times the log base e of a, which is just the log base e of a itself. But you're probably not used to seeing log base e of anything. The log base e of a number is such an important concept in math due to its connection to exponential growth as a whole that it's been given its own name, the natural logarithm. Now we're going to finally talk about the most beautiful equation in all of mathematics, which is e to the pi times i is equal to minus 1, which is the famous Euler identity. Let me first quickly remind you what complex numbers even were. Complex numbers are an extension of real numbers. They consist of two components, the real and the imaginary one, where the imaginary part is the square root of negative 1, or rather some multiple of it. Because those numbers have two separate components, we can't effectively graph them on a number line. Due to the nature we need a two-dimensional plane to present them on, we call it the complex plane. Each complex number can be represented as a point on that plane with a real and imaginary coordinate assigned to it. We usually write complex numbers as z equal to a plus b times i for some real a and b. This way, a represents the distance we have to walk to the right along the real axis and b the distance that we have to move up along the imaginary axis to get to z. But this is not the only possible way to present a complex number. If we consider the length of the line segment connecting point z to the origin of the complex plane, given by the absolute value of z and the angle theta between that segment and the real axis, we can use some trigonometry to denote the distance that we have to walk along the real axis as cosine of theta, and this has to walk along the imaginary axis as sine of theta. This way we can rewrite our complex number as cosine of theta plus i sine of theta, we're gonna need it later. So to prove the Euler's identity, we're gonna need to derive the Euler's formula. And yeah, there are a lot of Euler things today and in the world in general. So it states that e to the power of i, the imaginary unit, times any theta is equal to cosine of theta plus i times sine of that theta. How do we prove it? I would like to evoke the thing called the Taylor series expansion of a function. It enables us to write almost any function as an infinite polynomial, and I'm not gonna be really talking a lot about it today, is topic for another video, I'm just gonna use it and express sine and cosine as those two polynomials right up there. Let's once again use the polynomial that we proved would describe the exponential function and plug in theta multiplied by i 
for our X. I don't really like all of those eyes in weird powers, so let me just quickly rewrite those. So knowing that I is equal to the square root of negative 1, we've got all of those powers like this, and we can plug this into our polynomial, getting this thing right over here, and well, it starts to look a little bit familiar. I mean, just look at those expressions of cosine and sine of theta. If you don't see it, let me just multiply that series that represents the sine by an additional i, and you should probably already see it. The polynomial that describes e to the items theta is precisely the sum of the two polynomials that describe cosine of theta and i multiplied by the sine of theta. Well, basically the theorem proof. And to finally derive the Euler's identity, let's just express negative one as a complex number in a sense. And so we're gonna express it using the length of the line segment that connects it to the origin and the angle that it makes with the real axis. They are respectively one and pi. And plugging it into the polar form of a complex number that we derived earlier, we'll get this thing, but through Euler's formula, we know that this is equal to precisely e to the pi times i. So that's all I have to say about the Euler's number. I really hope you guys enjoyed it and hope we'll see you in the next one.